<laughs> it is 2.30 on Wednesday. We have our regularly scheduled Arcane Radio podcast. We have with us today Andrew Beck of Beck and Stone, a former colleague of mine from Blue Fountain Media up in my New York days. Um, it's great having you, Andrew. Mike, great to be on. So uh, I just wanted to regroup um, and, and recall a conversation we were having beforehand about uh, you sort of deciding to, to leave Blue Fountain and, and go out and, and start this, uh, this new firm of yours. So I wanted to get an idea of, of sort of, you know, why, why it is that you decided to do this. Um, but more importantly, you know, who is Beck and Stone? What it is that you guys do? Yeah, sure. Well, so uh, first of all, with Beck and Stone, it was something where um, it started, of course, with myself and then with my partner, Austin Stone. And we had met on a certain project um, and you know, found out that, yeah, we, we meshed and uh, that, that there was some, uh, some great synergy there. But I think we also found a meaning of the minds. Uh, he, of course, was someone who was like a strategic management consultant. He um, was a uh, an, uh, uh, account director, um, somebody who uh, was a very excellent project manager. And then me, I was this very diversified creative generalist uh, where I, I handled all these different sort of skill sets. And so there was this very um, hand in glove uh, uh, meeting of him and I in terms of the hard skills. But I think it was also, we had the same mindset that we wanted to care. We wanted to uh, you know, care more in the work that we did for the, for the clients that we worked for more than we had both experienced elsewhere. Uh, there, that you know, it wouldn't just be this kind of factory where projects come in, you know, whole accounts will come in and then they get spit out at the other end after they go through this one set process, but that there would be a consultative approach that a uh, client could come to us with not just, okay, we, we want you to make something, but come to us and say, we have a problem or we um, have a challenge and we want your help, not just in making the fix happen. We want to know from you what the fix is. We want to get your perspective. And, and in order to, to do that, there, of course, yes, has to be demonstrated that there is some, uh, that, that there are those hard skills. And, and so me, uh, back in the early day, uh, having all these uh, sort of varied skills um, let us do a lot of work uh, when it was just he and I. But then we, we began to expand and uh, really have um, uh, uh, employees, uh, you know, uh, uh, more than just a couple of clients, and we, we wanted that to carry on. And, and so that mindset of uh, caring about the work, of you know, having that consultative approach, caring about not just making something that's exciting or that's pleasant for us, um, but something that on the other end we knew was appropriate, that we knew was going to get results. Um, that's the that's that's uh, that's what we're all about. Very cool. You know, I always sort of expected that you were going to go out and do something on your own. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about and bring back into this discussion was uh, something that we were talking about before we started broadcasting, uh, namely about you leaving Blue Fountain. Um, I remember a distinct conversation we had in the car headed up to uh, Mount Kisco Grand Prix to go go-kart racing. Uh, we had, <laughs> we had uh, been stuck in Times Square for about an hour waiting on Dennis's girlfriend, uh, who I guess had been lost. And uh, we started heading up the West Side Highway, and I remember chatting with you about BFM standard procedures. Um, and I had only been there for a, maybe it was a, like a month, and um, and thinking, oh boy, this guy's not really sticking around. <laughs> uh, you'd said something about um, that you didn't you didn't feel as though they were headed in the right direction, uh, you know, operating procedure wise or standards wise. And I remember um, I had taken one of those seminars, like a Tony Robbins seminar, but you know, not, not Tony Robbins, <laughs> um, <clears throat> where they were, uh, you know, far too influential in your thinking. I remember saying something like, well, you know, if you think that your approach is the best approach, then why are you bothering, you know, dealing with these people? I remember your response was very matter of fact and, and optimistic, like you had considered the, <laughs> this before. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. All right. So, I mean, look, look, the, the, 
you know, anybody who knew me at Blue Fountain knew that, well, number one, that I was loud. Uh, and and that, that means just in terms of decibel level, uh, you know, I, people, people heard me when I uh, talked. And so, yeah, part of that's just a, you know, an issue of, of, uh, you know, lack of self-awareness, but also just because I, you know, I wanted to participate, you know, I wanted to be heard, I wanted to um, make a difference, and not just make a difference in terms of, well, oh, you know, I just personally want to feel like, um, you know, I'm advancing, and that I'm, uh, uh, you know, doing well, I wanted to, oh, to, and this is from, really any company that I joined, whether it was before Blue Fountain um, or even with my own, I wanted to feel like I was a part of something bigger than myself, that it was something where um, I was kind of contributing to a corporate success and not corporate as in, oh, there's this corporation, corporate as in a group of people who are all working. I want to feel like we are succeeding and we are moving forward. Um, and that requires change, that requires evolving. Yeah, to that point, you know, I think a lot of people really get bogged down in the project life cycle as opposed to the product life cycle at agencies. Um, a lot of agencies at Blue Fountain Media in particular, uh, they treat it sort of as an assembly line where you're handling your one part of the project and then handing it off. Uh, in fact, the word handoff um, <laughs> was was used far too often uh, as opposed to, um, you know, collaborating throughout the, the life of the project. Um, you know, w one of the things we like to do as a product development company is getting into things that we ordinarily wouldn't in our discipline. And uh, branding is certainly one of them. Um, you know, <laughs> that was good timing. Uh, you know, user interfaces and conversion rate optimization and performance and things of that nature. That's the kind of stuff that you as a developer don't really get to get involved in uh, unless you're brought into the full life cycle of the product instead of just the project build itself. Um, and so like, even our developers and quality assurance resources and designers, uh, they're all getting involved in the actual branding discussion. And um, one of the things that we've been talking about over the past couple weeks is how to target recognizable brand names and that there are, are aspects to any human language <coughs> that are uh, consistent and shared from one brand to another, like the number of syllables or character recognition, um, things like that, which have a, a psychological impact to them. They're not really what we call the, the lees and the fies. You know, someone gets a word relevant to the industry and then they put like Lee or Phi at the end of it, which, you know, is, is really, it's really just sort of half-assed brand naming. <laughs> and, and so that's a, a conversation we've been having, but we haven't really talked about the design impact. Um, I know that there's a psychology behind design, you know, how geometric figures and, and colors um, impact, I guess, or I guess like allow you to sort of separate your customers from their money, so to speak. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about how Beckenstone approaches branding from a, a design perspective. Sure, sure. Well, like just the the uh, the importance of a name um, really can't be um, can't be talked about enough because it isn't just a name. It isn't just something where uh, yeah, you can just take a word and remove some vowels or add a lee or an er at the end, and then suddenly, oh, yeah, that's that's the name. I mean, part of it is just one, um, you know, people have already done it. Things have already come before, mm -hmm. so that you just you just know that okay, you know, I just I just have a, a more limited. Um, you know, area to work in uh, the, you just uh, there's you know uh, finding a domain name finding something uh, that is going to you know going to be unique let alone objectively good is extremely difficult that's why that tool that arcane has uh, is very useful because it's just letting you see okay here's just here's here's like here's a way for you to make an informed decision because url uh, and your name as a as a product. I mean, if you're going to be making software, if if, if you're going to be a you know, software as a service company, uh, you you kind of need that. You you kind of need to to have some al alignment on that. Um, but then, really, when we, when we look at what names have endured, when we look at the names that have really been able to find um, you know, permanence. They aren't these sort of ephemeral, um, you know, products that pop up. You know, there's, there's, you know, certain characteristics, of course, but most of it are there's there's some kind of as association. 
um, you know, people had this big craze about doing made up words. Oh, we, we want things to be some kind of unique thing. People saw, saw Google and was like, oh yeah, well, you know, that makes sense. But for the most part, um, we look at, you know, sort of like the uh, tech companies that have really endured, they, there is some cultural background behind it. There is some meaning to it because they're tapping into uh, somebody's subconscious. They're tapping into their experience. Somebody had heard the name Uber uh, not uh, that many times, maybe before Uber came around, but it was still there. They, ha they had still heard it. They had heard it maybe in school. And does the name Uber have anything to do with picking up people in cars? No, <laughs> but it was something where they said, this this thing is superior this thing is better it is it is the culmination i mean if we read uh you know nietzsche and the 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 idea of the ubermunch you know it it is the pinnacle it is the it is the most highly evolved man that there is so just calling something uber i mean now you could you know they, they could have gone oh uber car or uber auto but no they said listen we we just want to have this connotation we want to tap into this subconscious and just pluck that single cord that is in people's memory. Um, and, and, and it's this, it's the same thing like Facebook as well. There's this, there's a side to it where when you say, okay, well, uh, my space, uh, people said, all right, that there's something personal, I can kind of customize it. Facebook wasn't necessarily going to have that, but there was a personal connection to it. And it was, yeah, based yeah. on this profile, based on this is a real person who you're interacting with. And it's someone who you know, it's someone who is being transparent with you. And then, you know, having it be a book, see, a book you can close, right? A book is kind of self-contained. And that's why, uh, you know, Facebook really as this, as this, uh, you know, uh, sort of epitome of a social network, because it was, it was a, it was a closed connection it was about this network where um you know there was like a, a sense of security and which seems funny nowadays but facebook really became what it was or, or what it what it what it now is it, it sort of gained that success because people started to offer up their lives to us people started being transparent on it because they felt secure they wouldn't put their stuff up on Twitter because, oh, there might be some weirdos. They, don't, they wouldn't put <laughs> stuff, some, some stuff up on MySpace because, oh, there, there, there may be someone who will, who will try to steal my identity or find out where I live and try to kill me. Uh, whereas, whereas, you know, Facebook, they said, this is a safe place. It's only me and my friends. And, it, and, and it's like this network, uh, this, this like, platform that I can just kind of stay and not just play in and, and not just have fun in, uh, but, but, but to actually kind of like live my life, to kind of have the space time with, with uh, my friends and family. Uh, so, so when you really you know, sort of you know, think about naming, and yeah, we, we very rarely actually do naming projects, but the, like, let's, just, let's just take this one that we uh, did recently. So it's a, um, it is a uh, marketplace. Now you may re remember Lease Break, uh, from way back in the day, from, from, it was a Blue Fountain project that later on when they decided, okay, hey, we, we sort of want to do, you know, like an evolution. Uh, they, they came to Beck and Stone uh, because, of, of course, they had, you know, kind of worked with me before. And they said, all right, we, we want to do some kind of new design. You know, lease break is a, a bit, uh, you know, not long in the tooth, but we, we're, we're trying to reach a different audience. We want to preserve the concept of a lease break. It's something that their founder, Phil Horgan, came up with, uh, you know, for someone being in New York real estate, he, he just, he, he kind of found that real special sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, niche or need to, you know, exploit and lease break did it perfectly. Um, but then, okay, they, they wanted to compete with something like Trulia, with, with something really like Zillow and Street Easy, uh, you know, all those, all those different Zillow properties. And so he said, okay, we now need something that is going to say, one, that this is a free marketplace. That, it, first of all, it, it is a marketplace. It isn't just brokers, uh, uh, but, but really it isn't, you know, about whether it's brokers or whether it's tenants, uh, whether it's homeowners or whether it's not. It's about that there's this transparency to it that it's just a marketplace and that it's neutral, though it's policed by people at freely, uh, at, uh, you know, lease break, 
we want it to be something that is seen as free and open to all, yet with the security, with the confidence that people can con- can conduct these real estate trans- transactions freely. Gotcha. After a lot of conversations, we said the name is Freely. That that just is the name. But we said, all right, so uh, you know, Freely is a name we we did, of course, all those different uh, you know kind of cultural uh, you know stuff where where we didn't want it to. Um, seemed like it was something that was, um, you know, something like, a, you know, some, uh, 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 you know, like an internet tool necessarily, or like a software, some kind of, you know, simple application. I mean, this is this platform, this is this marketplace, and it also needed to be different. There had to be something about it that stuck out, not just audibly, but visually. So, so you know, when we, when we say the word freely, okay, if, if, if we can spell, uh, we we know that it's spelled F R E E L Y. Now, okay, you know that's not <laughs> wrong, but it it just visually it lacked power. Visually, it it uh, you know wasn't um, pleasing to look at, par- particularly when you would line it up against something like Zillow or Trulia, which again are these fake names that that are just moshed together by different things but yet there's there there is some kind of sticking power to them because they they have uh you know ipping uh a a just sonically sounds good it's actually easy to say uh but then also how they look is uh how you can put in the url you say okay wow great yeah that that works i can remember that and then even with their branding okay i can remember how how that looks and and so what we came up with is, is we said let's do something it needs to be kind of edgy uh, but since it really is going to be focusing on sort of New York and really, you know, more urban areas, we you want to also have the sense of, um, uh, you know, be be a bit avant-garde. So we tackled both the branding uh, and the naming of it at the same time, and we came up with if if we say uh, if, if we say freely, what it is called is freely, but how it looks, how it is spelled is is F R E with the uh you know vowel sign that line up up above the e uh l and then again that e with that long e vowel sign above it you're not only telling somebody how something is spelled you are getting a unique url so they 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 could get the url f-r-e-l-e.com uh which was which was a huge score was a you know huge part of what that project entailed uh but then they could also have something that visually we could work with that. It, ha- it, it, it had power to it because it was symmetrical, because it was shorter, because it didn't have that Y at the end, which, you know, once, once people kind of see that, uh, that, that, that kind of, you know, L, Y at the end of something, they automatically think like, ah, eh, this is some kind of like, you know, a web 2.0, uh, you know, tool or, you know, mm. something kind of corny. And, and, and so we then you know, nailed all those different aspects so that when we went into the design phase uh, for the website, we, 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 we had this clear idea of not just what this platform does, not just what this, what this software will, will so- somehow do. I mean, us as the consultants and you know, us as the designers knew that from a brand perspective, there was now purpose there was there was a vision because while we were naming it we could sort of have those conversations with the client and then get them to say yeah this is who we are so when we got into the design phase it went by very smoothly and we produced something where you said okay this is some this is something that is very different from what you will see on street easy and that's what we want to be we you know, want to to be just like how street easy tries to kind of um uh, you know, appropriate uh, certain aspects of, of like, say, you know, Zillow's identity, because they want to see that there's sort of trust here, they, they want to show that, um, you know, that there's going to be this good user experience. We wanted to show that this is something that is very different. This is something that is very out of left field, but it isn't different simply visually. It is different. Well, the reason why it is different visually is because intrinsically, operationally, there is something different about it. And I mean that, that I, I could I could get into you know more about how yeah you know operations uh, and like the the way that you do things uh, factors into branding almost more than visuals, uh, but but yeah I've I've kind of 
ranted here. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, that makes a good deal of sense. Uh, there's a, an entry point, and then here's you know how you interact with the customer afterwards. And I think that carries a, a good deal of credence in how brand recognition affects the long term. Um, you know, like customer service affects longevity. That's a given. Uh, but if you're going to get them in the door, you've got to look pretty and shiny and, you know, appeal to people's visual interests in some way. Um, so we still have a few minutes here, and I wanted to get your perspective on a couple of things. Uh, so if you could put this in a nutshell, you know, <clears throat> how would you, going back to the Uber conversation, compare Uber to a competitor like Lyft from a branding standpoint, um, if you had to sort of look at it, like the name, the logo, the application, you know, where is one beating another? You know, where do you think that things are, are going as far as future branding trends are concerned outside of, you know, rainbow capitalism type arguments and fake attempts at being socially conscious and all that nonsense? So, so I mean, one, you know, a lot of that nonsense really does factor into the branding. I mean, it, 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 it kind of, you know, tips what the, uh, what challenges they know they are going to be facing, yeah, from a business standpoint, but also from a societal standpoint. You had somebody like Airbnb radically change the way that they looked in their branding, but not just their branding. They changed the messaging. They changed their UI. And why? Because they knew that they were going to be coming up to this problem where people were going to start seeing them for what they were, something that was, uh, that was actually uh, propagating gentrification, that was creating unsafe circumstances, that was really you know, more about people uh, in, in these sort of you know, dense urban areas that are very popular, um, getting, you know, being able to sort of rent out their places um, and you know, make, make kind of a premium on it, you know, people who could more than afford to actually live there. Uh, whereas, so what, did they, what do they do? They change to be very host centric. It's about our host. They, they start highlighting people from third world countries. And oh, look, they, they, you know, there's like a windmill that you can rent out in the Netherlands. And there's a lighthouse that you could, uh, you know, rent out in, 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 in uh, Nicaragua or wherever it may be. And, you know, if, if, if you hurt us, if you hurt Airbnb, you hurt this poor man. You hurt this poor person. You are taking away their livelihood. And, and, and you can see that's then the, the things that they start putting even on their uh, front page. It's about experiences. It's about going to these you know, lo locales. But what they know, the vast majority of their listings and the vast majority of their traffic are so that people can uh, get into these very uh, you know, densely populated, very expensive metropolitan areas for short periods of time, uh, without having to go through hotels, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, you know, kind of like get, uh, you know, more sort of flexible terms on it. So, uh, so, so in very much the same way, Uber has had to change, like, not just once their branding, they, they changed it twice. They, 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 uh, well, and, I mean, probably even three or four times, but really the, the two main iterations were the one that they did with uh, Travis, Co um, you know, I'm still not sure how to say that guy's last name, but, you know, Trevor Kalinick or... or uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty close. <laughs> okay, great, great. So uh, they kind of did that, and it was pretty much like this internal job where he himself was sort of, you know, piloting it and sort of doing all this stuff. Well, long story short, it was kind of disastrous. Um, but then also the, you know, he left the company. He was, he was kind of, you know, ousted, um, shown the door, so to speak. And, you know, much of it was there was sort of this, um, there was this, you know, attitude that was forming around Uber that it was toxic, not just toxic for the people uh, who, who were, you know, in these, again, densely populated cities where you have things like, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, like, not just you know necessarily hurting taxi drivers, but putting more cars on the road, in, increasing congestion, uh, taking advantage of people uh, who who are you know uh, you know technically not employees, so that they can skirt these different labor laws. Um, you know the, all, all these all these sort of various things. And I mean, let's not even you know, look at the investing side of it, but also at the company itself. A you know there was there were some certain reports that were coming out. Uh, that it was a toxic work environment. So the leadership wisely says, okay, we need to pivot. This isn't just about fancy stuff. It isn't just about fonts and colors and shiny and you know marketing. You know, so sometimes people will only think of branding as something that's done for marketing, whereas it can be done for morale. A a a a rebrand or a new brand should be thinking 
greater than just how do we get more people to sign up for this? It has to be, how are people perceiving this? What does this say about our company? What does it say about our reputation? And, and so when they did that rebrand, they had said, we're not doing some internal job. We're not gonna go cheap on this. We're going to freaking Wolf Olin's and they're gonna design us something. And they did. And what they did is that they made it austere. They made it corporate. They made it something where it, where it looks like it's there to stay because it looks like it has been around forever. It looks like something that would, would be, you know, a, uh, you know, Delta redesign. It, it looks like something that, that is at a much older company than it is, not one that hadn't even IPO'd yet. And part of it was because they wanted to give people trust. Yes, Uber might be going through a rough patch. Yes, there may be something going on, but we're here to stay. And we are about austerity. We are about confidence. We are about you just, you know, getting to where you need to go. We, we are, you know, we are just this, this neutral middleman. We are just this neutral platform that, that just facilitates rides and, and, and it kind of loses all the different, you know, cutesy illustrations that they had and all the different shots of, you know, people getting in and out of cars and laughing with their Uber driver. No, 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 no. They, they want to pretend like the, like the drivers aren't even there. And part of it was because they, they knew, of course, that they had to IPO soon and that they knew that they had to change not just consumers and investors' uh, uh, impression of them that they had probably rightfully built up, uh, but also their employees, also potential employees that, that they want to work with. They, they, they had to boost that mor- they had to boost that morale they, they had to flush what was uh, what was you know left of their you know CEO out with the bilge uh, and and that meant the branding with it so when right. you can look at it you know, something like Lyft they've been able to stay because they've been able to preserve some of their brand integrity because their reputation their their reputation not just as a as a brand this 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 social construct that people think of when we when we say certain words uh uh but their 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 actual business reputation has kind of weathered or or has actually panned out uh much better in the long run than uber so i would say that lyft has the advantage not just because they they you know look a certain way they they have been able to have this visual consistency yes where there's been certain evolutions um but but for the most part they have been able to stay the same and they now have that 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 kind of brand legacy because they have a business track record of doing things the right way of avoiding negative press of you know getting people who are happy to work there um that's uh, that's that, that's where i think um that that all shakes out between uh lyft and uber and frankly i i think that the uh i think that in in their you know ipos um that's that's how it that's that's how it broke down gotcha yeah uh if if i could i might suggest and correct me if i'm wrong but it could almost be said that if you get to the point where you're really confident about your product that almost reducing your visual uh, design and it allows your customer to focus a little bit more about the service you're offering. You know, if your product is strong enough, it should actually be able to outshine your aesthetics. Right. Right. Uh, the, the the concept of restraint is is uh, really underrated uh, be, because you can have something that um, you know is extremely iconic and is ex- uh, you know has has a lot of. Um, you know, brand power, so to speak, you know, something like the, you know, Nike swoosh, uh, but it's just sort of like this simple kind of, um, kind of uh, mark, but really branding goes way beyond your identification. I mean, that's just sort of like logos, right? But especially when it comes to building products um, or using these products to, you know, conduct some kind of service, something, yeah, like, like Uber, um, something like Amazon. I mean, Amazon has had one of the worst user experiences uh, one of the most ugly interfaces uh, for years. And I, I mean, look, like I hate Amazon for numerous reasons, but uh, well, the, one of the main reasons why I didn't really become an Amazon user very early was be- because um, I just hated the shopping experience. So, um, you know, some, sometimes, it, sometimes it matters. Sometimes the user interface matters, but, but people 
people can also see through that. I think that the things that work out sometimes work out in spite of designers, rather because of designers. We, we, we sort of take too much uh, responsibility for their successes and we get blamed too much when there's failures. Uh, but for the most part, if, if, if you have something that people want, if it's at a certain price that they want, if the experience, getting something shipped to you very quickly, you know, giving you that free shipping, putting everything in one place, et cetera, that ultimately matters more than how something looks. You can have these flagship stores uh, that, that you know, have all these different specialty goods, but when Walmart came to town, this big, ugly thing with no charm, with these very sterile looking aisles, with no kind of branding other than this hideous blue and, and you know, Helvetica uh, to look at, Walmart swept them out because ultimately the customer experience won. What, what people were getting from it was greater than you know what, what than 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 sort of how it was wooing them uh, during that or uh, before or during that process. Gotcha. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so, I, mean, I guess just to tie off here, if you could leave some sort of message for, uh, uh, we're going to be dealing with an audience that's primarily startups, not really dealing with as much of a scenario like Uber has, where they're able to be very product forward because they have an existing client base. Um, what sort of recommendation might you provide within reason? <laughs> um, obviously, you don't want to give out the secret sauce because that is your bread and butter, uh, not to continue going with all these sort of uh, metaphors about food. <laughs> Some sort of advice to, to anyone out there who might be listening as a startup, um, what, what might you leave with them? Sure, sure. Well, let me just quote uh, one who is greater than than I, uh, one by the name of Jesus. And uh, he's, he said uh, in, this, in this certain verse, he said, uh, by your words, you shall be justified and by your words, you shall be condemned. And so what I would say is to, I mean, yeah, to startups, but also to businesses who are really looking at where do we go from here? What, uh, how, do we, how do we grow? Before, uh, you know, we, we think about what, what colors, you know, the quote unquote fun stuff, we need to think of the hard stuff we, and, and really words are hard. And the reason why words are hard is because they involve risk. It's you know, more risky to you know, say certain sentences, to, to use certain words, uh, to, to, to name yourself a you know, certain something rather than having a color because you can, you can, you can change colors and uh, you know, nobody will care. Um, you can, you know, change a logo, you can change an interface, you could completely reshape something, but the words that are used with it carry, they endure and they make an impact. Um, somebody who is able to uh, get their branding right from their name and from the words that they use, you know, having a brand manifesto is something that a ton of brands don't even have. And they'll, they'll have a huge branding guidelines package with all these sort of things detailing all their various uh, 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 brand elements to you know very small detail, but then yet have nothing in there about hey this is this is kind of who we are. Um, this is this is the words that we use to describe ourselves. These are the words that we stay away from, and yet these are the things that um, if 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 consulted properly, if, you know, sort of steered correctly, um, people, people will start to differentiate themselves from people. And, and yes, that's, that's on a, you know, very macro level, such as, oh, like the, you know, name that you're called, but also on a, on a very micro level, instead of using words like, uh, you know, your, your, your one-stop shop for all your fill in your industry solutions, uh, I mean, like, uh, how many times are, 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 are people hearing that same kind of stuff? Whereas when you put something out there, when you say something, when you make them read something that is gripping or that is different or that makes them think or maybe even shocks or uh, offends them to, within reason, uh, uh, that, that has staying power. So, yeah, what I would say is uh, before visuals, think of, think of names Think of your thinking of what what uh, words you are going to use, and let the branding come from those words. Awesome. Well, you heard it right there from Andrew Beck of Beck and Stone. Appreciate your time, Andrew. Um, it was it was awesome getting to chat with you, and um, hopefully we get the opportunity to chat again in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I uh, I uh, had a lot of fun, and um, 
I wish you all the best. We're going to definitely have to catch up sometime next time you're in New York or when I'm in Savannah. We, we, uh, we have a client down there that we are doing a uh, magazine redesign for. So Oh, very cool, man. Next time I'm in, I'm in town. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll be there. Uh, yeah, I've got family. You know, we've got all sorts of things to do. Um, but uh, uh, we'll be up there um, a couple times. I'll, I might be up there for business sometime in the near future, so I'll let you know. Cool. All right, Mike, thank you. Yep.